My name is Seth Manukin. I'm the director of the Communications Forum. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out. Um, a couple of announcements before we begin. Uh, if you ask questions, and we hope that you do ask questions, please come up to one of the microphones. We would really appreciate it if you would identify yourself. Um, we do uh, record these, and we also keep transcripts of them for the record, and so it's always nice to have your name. Um, we also have a mailing list up here. Uh, so if you enjoy this and events like this, please sign up for our mailing list. We only have six events a year, and we do not send emails out for anything other than our six events. So this will not be a mailing list that you will get a lot of spam with. Um, we'd also like to thank Radius, uh, who is a co-sponsor of tonight's forum um, and has been a sponsor of a lot of our forums over the last couple of years, a co-sponsor. Uh, without their support, we would not be able to do this. Um, and without any further ado, uh, let me introduce tonight's panel. Uh, Dr. Eric Lander is the president and founding director of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, a professor of biology at MIT and a professor of systems biology at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Lander was a principal leader of the Human Genome Project and from 2009 to 2017, he served as co-chair of PCAST, uh, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology under Barack Obama. Dr. Landers won the MacArthur Founda Fellowship, the MacArthur Foundation. He won the whole foundation. It's, it's a nice thing to get. Uh, yeah. I appreciate it. Um, the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, the Albany Prize in Medicine and Biological Research, the Mendel Medal of the Genetics Society in the UK, the Award for Public Understanding of Science and Technology from AAAS, and the Woodrow Wilson Prize for Public Service from Princeton University, among many, many other awards. Dr. Maria Zuber is the MIT Vice President for Research and the E.A. Griswold Professor of Geophysics. Dr. Zuber has been involved in more than half a dozen NASA planetary missions and is the principal investigator for the Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory, or GRAIL, became the first woman to lead a NASA spacecraft mission. In 2016, Zuber was elected to a two-year term as the chair of the National Science Board, the governing body of the National Science Foundation, and earlier this week, she was appointed to another six-year term on the board. At MIT, Dr. Zuber oversees research administration and policy for more than a dozen interdisciplinary research laboratories and centers, and her many accolades include multiple NASA Group Achievement Awards, the Harry A. Harry H. Hess Medal from the American Geophysical Union and the Carl Sagan Memorial Award. Uh, so thank you both for joining us tonight. Um, I wanted to start uh, just sort of generally and ask you, um, at what point did both of you realize that you wanted to be a scientist or go into science? Um, so uh, science chose me. I didn't, so there, there are uh, legends in my family about me jumping up and down in my playpen pointing at the television when the rockets were launching. Ah, wow. And, um, and I, um, I wanted to be a scientist uh, forever. And I started um, uh, building telescopes when I was about six. I taught myself optics. I ground my own lenses. And, um, and all I ever wanted to do was study space, and, uh, and I'm still doing it. Right, wow. It's, it's working. And so you, you really knew it at, at age six or seven that that's what you wanted to do. Yeah. That's incredible. How, how about you, Eric? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get over the grinding her own lenses. That's, that's... Wow, I'm not sure I let my kids grind their own lenses. <laughs> yeah, right, it's true. And it's probably, probably, like toxic, dust. probably toxic. Yeah, yeah. I have a six-year-old daughter. It's true. Wow. I'd probably shut myself down if I worked at MIT. Right, yeah, right. Exactly. So. Really? <laughs> so nothing like that at all. Okay. So I, I wasn't interested in science when I was growing up. I was interested in math. Right. So I did my undergraduate degree and my PhD in pure mathematics, and I fell in love with math in high school. I was in... New York kid, I, I was lucky enough to go to Stuyvesant High School and you know, found the math team. And so I fell in love with mathematics. Um, was lucky enough that Columbia University had a New York City-wide science honors program and I could take the train up to Columbia on weekends and learn about Galois theory and other right. things. And then went to, to 
you know, onward to math until after getting my PhD in math, I realized I didn't want to do math as a career. I just loved it because math was very monastic and right. it really wasn't, it wasn't as in the world. And so I cast about for a number of years and through a long series of accidents, um, fell in love with biology and in particular genetics. So the last genetics course I took for, the last biology course I took for a grade was sophomore year of high school. So How'd you do? I have no idea, but in any case, it means that I'm actually unqualified for my for your, job. For your, right. um, <laughs> but I have tenure, so it's too late. Right. What, what can you do? Right. So, you know, but I did. The one thing I have in common with Maria was my, my mom let me stay home whenever they launched the rockets. So I watched all the NASA launches, and this was like really inspiring and transformative to feel like that was going on, that change was happening. Though, you know, I've never thought about working in space or, or leading a space mission. In the 60s, that was really, it was amazing. And, and now that both of you are, um, you're in charge of research here, you're running a big institute, how, do, do you miss the sort of day-to-day -day doing, doing bench work, overseeing your own experiments, not needing to oversee big teams of people? So I'm, I don't think we've given up doing research. Yeah, we, but we're both, no, we're both oh, still very both active still doing it. Your, right. You have your laps, of course. But, yeah. but, uh, but I assume your other responsibilities also take up a, a Oh, they take up time, time. yeah. yeah. Uh, well, um, yeah, so I've obviously shrunk my research group a fair amount. And I have more postdocs now than graduate students. But I share, I share my graduate students with another professor to right. make sure. And then, then we always have a bunch of undergrads kind of running around um, uh, doing really useful things that we team up with um, with the graduate students and the postdocs. So, um, so I, um, I, you know, there are some days that are better than others when, um, when I prefer that I would, would be in the lab. But, um, but, you know, for me right now at this stage of my career, it's all about impact. And, right. um, and you know, after running big space missions, um, I want to have more impact than I had before. So, uh, <laughs> so helping, and, and that's hard when you've run a whole right, space exactly. mission. So, um, so uh, helping other people uh, create things and make things happen. So every, you know, every faculty member we hire here, they have a dream. Right. right? And, and just like we all have a dream. And, um, and usually there's something holding people back from achieving that dream, okay? It could be that they need uh, a lab renovation or they need a piece of equipment or maybe they just need to meet the right collaborator. Right. And, um, and so I, I actually get a lot of satisfaction out of removing barriers or creating opportunities to allow others to achieve their dreams because then great things inevitably happen at some point and, and I, you know, I feel like I played a really small part in that, but it's a, it's a rush. Yeah, yeah. Same ditto. thing. Yes. Ditto, <laughs> just, just ditto, because, you know, your experience running space missions, you know, mine working on the Human Genome Project, you want to have impact comparable to the impact you've had, and at a place like MIT or, or the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, there are just all of these amazing people, all these amazing projects, and so while you have less time for your own research, right. you're still mentoring. I mean, I think I feel like, I know Maria feels like we're mentoring colleagues, we're mentoring faculty, we're right. mentoring projects. And there's, there's a satisfaction and joy in that. Right. And at the same time, we still do research. Right, of course. We got a paper accepted to sell on Monday, and now we got we got yeah, we got to cut 40,000 characters out of the damn thing now. So. You know, you can run an institution or whatever, you pain of but, but you also have to worry about, you know, red penciling this thing down right. to the word length. And it's, it's, I think, really great around MIT that the people who play leadership roles still continue to do science. Right. Because it keeps you grounded. And actually, it's, it's, it's acceptable here. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, um, you know, what I, what I lose in administrative effectiveness or efficiency um, because I'm still carrying on, you know, a, a research program, granted a smaller one, 
you know, I, I feel like I more than make up for in having the continued respect of my colleagues that, um, that I haven't given up I just go on to the dark side. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Um, all right, I wanted to uh, sort of broadly define this term, the miracle machine, which we're using to, to connote the, the US's technological and scientific dominance in, in the 20th century. Um, what do you see as the ingredients that sort of led to that? Why was the US such a leader in the 20th century? Why don't you start with that? Sure. Um, you know, let's start with what, what is this, this miracle machine? Right. The idea that basic research is so powerful at producing useful things is not obvious. Right. Right? I mean, it, even to this day, many institutions, many countries think if you want something useful, you should try to make something useful. Applied research. Applied research. And the idea that really in this country comes in, in many ways out of Vannevar Bush Bush uh, after World War II, that research should not be done in government laboratories exclusively or even primarily, but should be done in universities and, and distributed research centers. And this, funded by the government. And funded by the government. Right. That, you know, in this, this famous report, Science, the Infinite Frontier, uh, you know, Vannevar Bush to, to President Roosevelt lays out a post-war strategy right. that, frankly, isn't obvious even coming out of World War II when you have Los Alamos and other things. And he says, you know, all that's good, but after World War II, this is the way to have the greatest impact is to place funds around the country and to have people compete based on proposals and ideas and grants. It's not central planning. It's not right. central laboratories. Well, so that's the first real ingredient to this miracle machine is you engage ideas all around the country. Um, and you do it with students, which is another part of the amazing thing. Why should you do research with people who aren't like yet trained and qualified? Right. Yeah, nutty. If you were, you know, most businesses wouldn't run their business with people who don't like aren't fully qualified. Right, right. And yet the magic of doing research with with students who are still learning is brilliant because you get freshness of ideas. Right. The staleness that sets in if you have just hermetically sealed yourself in something rather than having this flow of young people and ideas. And you're training your bench. At the and, and, you're tra and you're training the bench because, of course, those people are going off to populate companies. All right. of them. That's another brilliant part that wasn't obvious. Then, of course, the, the interaction between the academy and industry and government. This, right. This threefold, this this triangle here, the connection to industry, flow these students flowing out, ideas flowing out, IP flowing out, to be able to provide benefit to a society, and this virtuous cycle right. that comes from the government gets money from the prosperity, the prosperity is used to fund back basic research. And then of course you have had brilliant investment in the government sector. You know, most famously, a DARPA. Right. You know, folks who are willing to say, I'm not just interested in building tomorrow's missile or plane, but that you know, we too have to be asking long-term questions and being willing to fund that. So uh, you know, it's, it, it seems obvious when we take for granted the system that we have, but it's, very uh, odd. it's a very odd system. Yeah. Almost all of its assumptions would not have seemed obvious to people, and it was not what most countries in the world were doing. And eventually, when we've seen everything that's come from this virtuous system, other countries have said, yes, we should be doing it. But it's kind of wacky. But, and, we, and we were, the, we were like, and in many cases still are, the, the best attractor of talent in the world. Oh, yeah. right. and the, most, the most talented people in the world wanted to come and be a part of this. Right. And, um, and so it, it spoke for itself. It, it helped a great deal that, that when there were a lot of people who were refugees, we took them in. Right. Because America has always been that magnet to draw people from anywhere. Right. And at NASA, how did you see that interplay between basic research on a decentralized level, 
then funnel into actual applied science projects, sending people up in space? Um, well, I, I mean, I can give you just a, an example sure, from, my, from, my, from my own research. Okay? Yeah. So I, I came out of, um, uh, uh, I got my PhD at the time when um, Ronald Reagan was president. And, and so at that time, there was a great uh, investment in space-based lasers for- right. Star Wars. For Star Wars, for ballistic missile defense. And, um, and, and I said to myself, uh, it, you know, I mean, it was brand new technologies, but it was based on fundamental physics of how laser systems worked, okay? And uh, they were moving to solid state lasers as opposed to old, older designs that use flash lamps, which some of you in here may be familiar with. And flash lamps didn't last too long. And, right. and they were a high power. And, um, and so, so I said to myself, you know, if we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars um, into a laser tech, I bet you there's something I can do science with, okay? <laughs> and um, so I, um, I was at NASA, so I was able to get my um, clearance and um, look at, uh, the technology that these lasers were being used, and, and you know, it, it was all classified. Um, but in laser work, you know, the, the classification is the energy of the laser and the pointing of the how well you can point it and the stability. So, um, so you know, myself and a handful of other people that were kind of my age, just out of school, we we just took all those specs and just dialed them down until they were unclassified, and then. Um, <laughs> Turn up, NASA was was planning on sending a, a mission to Mars, and it was supposed to launch on the space shuttle, but the space shuttle blew up. So they had to find another launch vehicle for the spacecraft. It delayed. They threw several instruments out, so they opened up a competition for a new altimeter. And um, and so uh, myself and my buddies we uh, proposed this laser system. And um, with, with saying, well, we will never, ever be selected on this, but we're going to go in there and we are going to just kill this competition so that when we grow up, <laughs> they will remember us. So it, our performance beat the pants off of everything oh, else. Right. So we, ah. we got and you know, were competitively selected to send an instrument to Mars. Wow. And it was my second year out of grad school. Wow. So, and, and it was because... I was using um, technology that was based of, on f that was advanced because of fundamental science uh, about solid state lasers. Right, and and so I mean that's obviously that wasn't my plan. Right, right, <laughs> and it wasn't the DoD's plan. Right, um, it wasn't the DoD's plan to give you the no. Right, but, no. But, uh, right. so well, we're just okay. hanging around and right, yeah, <laughs> turning right. the dials. Right, right, right. <laughs> Um, uh, well, so we, we see the, the fruits of the miracle machine every day. Um, I just wanted to sort of, for a frame of reference, talk about some of what we mean by that. So what are some of the, what are some of the inventions that we use every day that came out of this basic research to applied research sort of engine in the 20th century? I mean, you know, they go all the way from GPS, right. for example, do we take for granted on cell phones? That um, came out of DARPA, is that right? Well, it, you know, it comes in a lot of different ways. But yes, in some ways it comes out of DARPA. Uh, in some ways it, it comes out of, I, I think GPS tracks back to when Sputnik was launched. And two folks at the University of Maryland or Johns Hopkins or somewhere were trying to figure out how to locate it. And they were sort of, uh, you know, ad hoc right. came up with the idea of positioning in the way of having multiple signals. And right. in a week, they sort of figured this out. But then, of course, you needed relativity to get an accurate signal because of time dilation up there. Right. And, and then eventually it gets turned into a system. So it's, it's this melange of different things. You know, the internet. Right. You know, this crazy mix of computer science at, at places like here in Cambridge and Carnegie Mellon yeah. and on the West Coast, um, meeting with 
well, again, the stories, you know, intertwine, but some threads say the survivability of computer networks, wanting to have, to have things that were survivable and right. therefore very distributed, but, but then a government saying, we're going to invest in this thing that isn't obviously very useful yet. Right. Uh, you know, passing messages back and short emails back and forth, but, you know, that explodes. Or, or an awful lot of biotechnology. When you think about Salvador Luria here at, at MIT, um, you know, and, and his work on this wacky phenomena about how certain bacteria can restrict certain viruses, and anyway, it gives rise to restriction enzymes eventually, which are one of the key tools of recombinant DNA. And, right. You know, nobody set out to say, oh, we're going to have a biomedical re revolution in recombinant DNA. They set out to say, how do, how do bacteria manage to copy their DNA? And how do they manage to fix it? And they collected just all the tools nature uses. And then at some point, they said, oh, we could start putting this together. Right. So if anybody had said, please build the following for us, you know, in, in some top-down fashion, we would have never gotten any of these these things right. in the fashion we got them. Right. So right. that's to me the, the heart of the miracle machine is most of these remarkable things we we count on was not somebody's, you know, central five year plan. Right. Something that emerged from by accident or through well, a combination. I don't want to call it accident because right. but it didn't emerge from a direct path. It emerged from funding fundamental curiosity and then being willing to run with it. I think the applied is important, but it was that combination. It was not trying to force something into a, a fully working mode. It was to let each stage begin to tell you what it was good for. Right, right. Yeah, and I, I, you know, just to add to that, I'll get into the, the people part of it a little bit. Um, you know, a lot of the precision machining and the measurements that were made to send things into space uh, you know, space is space is very unforgiving, it's a, and um, and so, you know, so you've you know, you've got to have everything perfectly correct, right? I mean, you have an actuator; it, you can't have any play in it. Right. right. I mean, and um, uh, you know, not all the people that go through this training to do this wind up staying in the field and doing that for a living, you know, what they work their thesis on. Right. But, you would want to, you know, if you had a company, you would want to hire a person that could machine something to that tolerance, right. right, and create something, or do the corrections on something to get down to nano levels. And, yeah, right, right. So, 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 so you had you had the the interplay between research and industry in this sort of diffuse sense that when you have people working to that degree of expertise and 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 specificity. Even if that's not precisely what they're going to be working on in industry, you're going to want those people. That's right. 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 Um, and when I think back over uh, sort of our society's relationship with science in the 20th century, um, my my sort of uh, vision of it in my head is that uh, obviously we had the the detonation of the A bomb at the end of World War II, but for a lot of the 20th century. The sort of our general view is that science was a force for sort of an unalloyed force for progress and good, and was going to lead us into the uh, into the future. Would you say that that's that my impression of that is correct? Um, well, it, not whether it is true, but whether that was the um, th that was the sort of zeitgeist. Uh, well, I, I would I would agree with that. Right. Okay. Sure. Yeah, Star Trek. I was brought up on right. the original Star Trek and. You know, you had this amazingly diverse crew. Right. Uh, you know, the Russians and the Americans, where you know, Jensen Chekhov was working with everybody else. It's great. Even even had, you know, Spock from another Inter, planet. Interspecies. Interspecies, right. right? It was, you know, it was, that was the optimistic view of the future. Right. That it was going to bring us all closer together, accept each other, et cetera. Yeah, right. that was what I was brought up on. In the, in the 60s. Right, right. And that we were going to, you know, explore, discover. Right. And, and certainly, uh, you know, Na NASA sort of embodies that, um, yeah. that sense of, of there's this endless mystery and we're going to go and, and, and learn about it. And mm -hmm. um, 
and so um, and we've talked about this a little bit. Now we're a couple of decades into the 21st century. And um, I think that there's more concern about whether these, uh, these inventions and whether all of this progress is necessarily going to be used for good. Um, we've talked about, you know, you have autonomous cars on the one hand and the specter of autonomous weapons on the other. Um, uh, you know, social media is something that can connect us and bring us together. It's also something that can disseminate hate speech or misinformation. Um, uh, is that sense that um, we need to pay attention to the implications of science and the implications of research, is that something that has cropped up sort of in a, in a forward way more recently, or is that? Look, science has just, just gotten so incredibly useful. Right? We didn't worry about spreading misinformation on the internet before we had an internet. Right. The internet is pervasive, and now we can also see the ways it can be misused. It's not a question of, you know, will technology be used for good or for bad? I think we now have a sophisticated understanding that all of these technologies are going to require responsible behavior. It's going to require responsible management. Biotechnologies, genome editing, gene drives uh, to, to change nature. Well, you know, gene drives. Maybe it's a way to get rid of malaria. Right. Gene drives. Maybe it's a way to screw up our environments completely. Right. Uh, you know, and, and both can be true. And so, and I can go down, and maybe we will go down a list of all of these things. There are enormous positive returns that could be had, but if we can't, as responsible scientists, also say there are a lot of potential misuses, biotechnologies that allow you to potentially design cancer-killing oncolytic viruses, that's the same biotechnologies that could let you design a bioweapon yeah, someday. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's more the question of the governance that's needed, the norms that are needed, how we run a world that's going to get the benefits while knowing full well that if we don't do this responsibly, we're going to get potential dystopias associated with it. Right. So it's just, I think, a grown-up technology we better take seriously. Yeah, and, you know, we, we think about this a lot. You know, I mean, so, I mean, at MIT, our ethos is, you know, we want to make a better world, so we want to help people. And, you know, so the idea out there that we're creating AI, right, that, that's going to put people out of work and they're not going to have jobs, this is, let me tell you, this is very worrisome to our researchers who say, no, I, we, you know, we, we have to create the future where um, how do we figure out how people can work with robots? How, you know, how, do, right, how right. do we how do we create the new jobs? And um, and so there's there's actually a huge amount of effort going on on campus now trying to trying to think these issues through in many sectors about uh, you know tr trying to consider the the ethical considerations in parallel. Right. As we're making these discoveries, I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, not waiting until, you know, we get to a certain point, but, you know, thinking about it at the same time. Right. Well, yeah. Well, I, I think it's maybe a little bit of a cultural difference in East Coast and West Coast. Everything's a generalization, but on the West Coast, there's maybe a little more of the techno optimism. Right. Whatever problem you have, technology will solve that problem, and I think I'm not. Sure that that's enough of an answer. Problems will arise that aren't necessarily solved by technology. They are going to take us understanding that technology can go wrong. What I frankly love about the community is that people feel like the community here. The community here is that people feel that it's their responsibility to make sure the technology doesn't get used wrong. Right. I guess my, my question is whether that notion of there being a parallel ethical responsibility is something that has been um, sort of more developed and more pronounced recently. And, and I think of a parallel in journalism in that kind of in American journalism, the history of American journalism, the sense always was our job is to put out information and we'll let people decide. We're not supposed to come down on one side or another. And 
the journalistic community has realized over the last several decades that actually when you're dealing with things that are true and not true, it's not acceptable to just put it out there. And there's been a sort of grappling with this need to have ethical guidelines as well. My, my sense is that there has been a similar thing that has happened in science, but maybe it's been there all No, long. well, I, you know, there's certainly a lot more discussion of it uh, lately. Um, and uh, I mean, ethical considerations, and then I, I would also say um, what's been going on for, for kind of a longer time ha has been the, uh, the idea of the students coming in, um, whatever they work on, they're really committed to leaving this world a better place than the world that they came into, okay? And, and what, I, what I attribute this to in part is, you know, the kids come in and, you know, starting in first or second grade, they all do community service, right? And we're, and the, the ones that are really motivated, they stick with it and they, they find something passionate in that and they carry it with them. So even if they're, you know, they could be a mathematician, right? Where, you know, you would go to a grad school because I want to solve this problem, right? But now they want to solve this problem so that they can help somebody or, uh, you know, I want to open up, you know, the, uh, 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 you know, reduce darkness in the universe by, you know, understanding how this works. And, you know, there, there's much more of a, of a commitment to, um, to really improving the human condition. So I'll, I'll give you, you know, actually an interesting example. We have, uh, you might be familiar with the fact we have a, a fusion startup that came out of uh, MIT, the Plasma Science and Fusion Lab. And, um, and these, uh, these folks, they're using high field superconducting magnets and, and actually hope to make a fusion uh, uh, power plant that's about the size of this room. Okay. Cool. Um, and um, and uh, as opposed to a big experiment that's being done in Europe that's the size of a football field. So, um, and the the motivation for uh, for these folks they 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 don't want to be billionaires. Mm -hmm. They don't want to win a Nobel Prize. They started <coughs> doing this because they're really really concerned about climate change, and there there is just there is just an absolute sense among them that they have to get on with this and this has to be done and we have to do it now and that's why they want to do it. Misha, I think there's a strong sense in, in this generation particularly the, the, the students now of mission as, as the driving force. And, and, and that's different from earlier generations? Yeah, well look, I mean there's always elements of it. We're talking about the proportion of it. Right. I think, I think you hear much more concern about mission as, as a driving force in life than, say, a generation or two earlier. And do you think that's because there's a greater sense of the precariousness of our situation now? Or is there another, is it because now you have community service sort of being built into curriculum starting in, in elementary school? I don't know, maybe, maybe it's because the world is able to communicate such, you know, so much Better, you know, from from the time we. I'm sorry, the world that they. Well, the, the world that they grow up in. I mean, right, they see right. parts of the world. I mean, you know, if you grew up and you were in a privileged existence, you wouldn't have seen the whole, right. you know, people in other parts of the world that that didn't, you know, have the same, uh, you know, all the things that you had. Right. Okay? But I, I think from, you know, certainly from the time that, you know, in Apollo 8 when we first got the view of, you know, Earth rise over the moon, and we saw the Earth as a you know, fragile place. Right. Um, it you know it got a lot of people thinking, and um, and now, uh, you know, kids growing up can see others in poverty or th see things. I mean, I grew up in a coal mining town. Where's where uh, that? Uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, in anthracite country, and where my father was a policeman, and he had one of the highest paying jobs in town. Right. right? And so, uh, but I I didn't think I was poor, because I. You know, in the area where I grew up in, you know, everybody was kind of the same. But, um, you know, then you go other places and you see what other people grew up with and their situations. And, um, uh, you know, it, it really affects you. So I, I just think that the, 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 the way that we see so much uh, of the world now, you know, really does impact people. Right, right. 
And uh, I'm curious, you mentioned this um, sort of East Coast, West Coast divide, and that- I think there's a divide, I said a little bit of a balance. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, why do you think that is? Because clearly, there, it's not like people are raised in the West Coast, go to school in the West Coast, then go and work in Silicon Valley. You have MIT as a large community over working in, in the tech industry. Um, uh, is that just because of the accumulation of wealth in the tech sector over the last couple of decades, or? Mm, I don't know. I think, I think it's a, a, a many, many different things, and I'm not sure I'm enough of a cultural anthropologist to really diagnose it. It's more just when I have dinners with people on the West Coast versus on the East Coast, right. the proportion of people who feel like technology will work it all out um, is just much higher, that they're really, that, that it couldn't go wrong. Right. Uh, I, think, I think the West Coast is still grappling with the idea that social media doesn't necessarily just unite everybody happily, that there are some downsides to it. Right. Um, so it may also be the fact that in, in some ways the institutions on the East Coast are a little older, a little more rooted in uh, the humanities and humanism and things that balance it in a certain way. It, it takes some historical perspective right. to recognize that um, you know, most things run into problems at some point in their life cycle, and you might as well plan on the fact that it's going to run into problems right. at, at some point. So it, it, you know, this isn't a black and white sort of thing. It's just, it's just that I detect more folks in conversations around here recognizing that to fulfill the dreams for technology, creating startups is a great thing, and it's not going to be enough right. because there are things that can't be done by the company. There are things that have to be done by a society because it's not in the interest of the company appropriately, and we've got to have multiple lo you know, loci of responsibility. Right. So I think there's more discussion about roles of government, roles of responsibility. I think there's you know, that kind of idealism to be willing to start uh, things that won't maximize profit, but will maximize mission. But again, I don't want to oversell this yeah, yeah. as, no, I, as yeah. you know, this is the distinction between right. the two, but I think, I think it's very important that these communities have slightly different sets of experiences, and, and I'm just struck that, you know, it's great That's we why, have yeah. a diverse country and the approaches, and then of course, there's a lot of the country that is left out of the tech revolutions entirely. Right? We, have, we have spots like Pittsburgh with Carnegie Mellon where you really have a tech center with jobs growing around it and industries going around it. But we should be as worried about the fact that the, the fruits of technology and the sense of, of agency that you can change things it's not uniformly distributed around the country, and are we? At least, yeah. Yeah, it's very non. I, 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 I understate for exaggeration. Um, this can't be a good thing for the country in the long run. Right. We have simply concentrations on the coast, on the coasts, you know, plus Carnegie Mellon, plus one or two other places or something. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, new jobs, new jobs are going to be created by the the tech industry. I mean, you know, technology and scientific advances are going to provide a basis for new knowledge that smart people are going to come in and figure out really interesting and in some cases lucrative things that could be done. But, you know, un unless we think about how those being displaced from the jobs that they have, you know, can benefit from the new economy, uh, we're, we're just not going to have a stable society. And that's, I mean, it's not to anybody's benefit. Yeah, there, there was, I think, a period in the 90s and early 2000s when we said average income is going up. Right. But maybe it's not, it's not enough to look at the average. Right. It might be the distribution is also really important. Right, right. Um, uh, yeah, you say may, maybe we won't have a stable society. It sort of feels like over the last couple of years that we might already be inching towards that place where there's such a divide that um, there are really deep divisions and uh, it's unclear how we move past that and, and whether technology and the technology sector is engaged in ways that can help us move past that. Well, we're, you know, we're, um, so in the um, 
I oversee the climate action plan. And right. one, of, one of the things that, um, that we've done is uh, we're thinking a lot about, um, you know, let's not just preach to the choir, okay? So people, people who understand, you know, that climate change is a real problem, uh, it's great that they understand that, but if we're only speaking to them, um, you know, it's we're not, we're not, not going to help the problem, that, right? right? So let's, um, let's, let's figure out who the messenger ought to be, right? Okay, so, um, so we've, uh, you know, we've actually got some of our social scientists and political scientists involved in doing some polling and, and understanding what, you know, what, what kind of messages would people accept and, and who should the messenger be? So, um, so you know, the word climate change so that is a, you know, it's, it's a third rail and you can't use that, but, um, but you know, people are feeling the impacts of, of changes that are going on. So, so you can talk about extreme weather and you can talk about change and, and, um, and the messenger shouldn't necessarily be some smart person from <coughs> MIT saying, Come on, guys. In fact, it probably know, shouldn't right? be. Right? Uh, no, but but it you know it 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 could be um, their children, right? You know who um, who who understand you know better of what's going on. Um, community leaders are great messengers. Uh, those in religious life right. that are grounded in the you know respected in the community. So the, these are the kinds of people that need to get engaged in this kind of messaging. I, it makes me think of Pittsburgh, when Pittsburgh air was so thick and dirty. Yeah. There was a period, I don't remember exactly when, when they invented the air quality index. And then air pollution became less abstract. It became the air quality index in this city today is low or terrible or whatever. And it made it, it made it real and kind of measurable. You started hearing it on the radio. And it led to cleanup of air because there were ways to describe it. And so it may be that these communications things are ways, ways to encapsulate things in ways that connect for people. The extreme events, I think, are, are some of the best. Yeah. And you know, this is a communications forum. Yeah. Communicating in right. a simple, straightforward way, you know, that uh, you know, instead of us being like twins and only talking to each other and no one can understand us, we have to figure out ways to communicate. Right. Yeah. And, and usually talking about what's gonna happen two hundred years from now is not, not is not that, that compelling. Not the way. Right, right. Um, uh, so, so you both have been in um, in advisory roles, scientific advisory roles on on a federal level, have gotten to look at a wide variety of issues. What keeps you up at night in terms of the areas of science that where we are not fully grappling with the potential implications, or need to very quickly grapple with them? Well, I. I you know the the federal budget for the last couple of years has um, has actually been better. Uh, it's been in terms of funding of science. Uh, correct. Right. Yeah. And um, so it's uh, no, but nobody in really in either party really liked sequestration, and they never thought that sequestration was going to happen. And then when it did happen, they 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 didn't really like it. And um, so the the budgets have have been okay. Um, but but in terms of buying power, they're they're down, and I, I worry about um, I worry about the level of investment that the U.S. is making relative to the level of investment that other parts of the country are making, and other and parts so of the country, the world. Or other parts of the excuse world. me, other parts of the world um, are making, and um, and so um, you know other now of course. Other countries, they have read our playbook, and um, and they realize that um, uh, investing in science, you know, means that you're going to get higher educate, you know, right. educated people who can start companies, and you know, innovation is starting to grow in other places. So the the, the share of the pie, so to speak, in in terms of discovery, is going to be more distributed. So right. it's it's not going to be fully U.S. dominated, but of course. The United States can benefit from discoveries in other places, um, uh, you know, just like 
others have benefited from things that we have discovered. But, uh, but I do think it's important for us to stay um, in the forefront on things. I, one area where I actually have particular concern is, um, is the, the biotech industry, actually. And, and um, so, uh, you know, so that's how many billions per year does the, the biotech industry contribute to the, the U.S. economy? And, um, and because of privacy considerations, um, we have limits in terms of the kind of data that we can collect on people and how we use that data, um, where, um, as in some other countries, notably China, um, the government takes all that data. And you know, so if, if we're thinking about personalized medicine and personalized treatments, uh, and um, you've got a really big database of personal data, and over here you have a smaller database, you know, that leads to a, to a mismatch. So that's a, that, to me, is one concern I have. It's interesting. I mean, it's a, the, the biotech's a topic I, of course, think a bunch about. Um, it's possibly the case that in biotech and in medicine, we're, it's not a question of privacy. It, it's, it's our inability to share data is as much technical right now that we haven't forced the healthcare system to be a learning system. Yeah. So one of, I feel, our great failures in the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology in 2009 was when the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act assigned $40 billion to electronic medical records. We wrote a report <coughs> that said the federal standards for receiving those monies called the Meaningful Use Standards, should require that the system be interoperable in order to get the reimbursement. But that never happened. But it never happened because industry managed to say, if that were required, planes would fall out of the sky, patients would die. It in would fact, patients possible. are dying because it wasn't right. required. And in many ways, it, it has been the reverse. Right. So we, we backed ourselves into a system that is more balkanized than ever and don't require universal exchange languages. Because what I do know from other projects we've started around here in Boston, that when you ask patients, they want to share their data. Yeah. So the reason I say I'm not, I, I, I would not even say privacy is the biggest problem, most patients, 90 plus percent of the patients, think we are sharing the data and learning from it. They actually want us to have this medical system, and we don't. I think we've got to really move to a world where our healthcare system is a learning system powered by all the patients who check the box and say, I wish my anonymous data to be used. Now, the place where I, I think your, your argument applies you know, with, with much more force is in, in a bunch of other areas where I, I think the, the broad point you're making, which is very large AI databases are going to beat very small AI databases, applies all over the place. This is certainly true in facial recognition technologies, many other technologies. So I, I actually broadly agree with the voice point. Recognition. Voice recognition. Voice yeah. recognition. Almost any of those sort of things. I, was, I wanted to put in this special you know, argument for our failure to get this other technolo <laughs> this technological barrier that that is blocking us. But I think your point is absolutely right. The, the scale of investment going on in China right now is going to allow AI to simply be better and more robust. And then there's another scale of investment, which I think is as consequential, which is in STEM education. I worry greatly that the investments that as a country, I mean, at the, at the high end of the distribution, MIT, Wow, the opportunities are better yeah, than anywhere right. in the world. But if you take the median student in the United States and their opportunity in STEM education, I worry about that investment too. So I mean, there's a lot of choices. Yeah, I'd, I'd say you know, I mean, you look at uh, you know first robotics competitions. You know, we yeah. we fill high school gyms. Yeah. And you know, in China, they're filling stadiums. Right. Yeah. And um, and so um, actually, the only way for us to continue to compete with that is is to continue immigration and bringing in right. as much talent as we can. Although now we see scale. more frequently that that talent is coming and then leaving. Well, yeah, 
maybe they don't always feel welcome. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so the, those those are concerns about uh, how the U.S. the U.S.'s role on a sort of world stage. What about kind of more meta concerns that the areas where um, we might not be fully considering the, the ethical implications of research? Are there er like you know Elon Musk has has talked at great length about how AI keeps him up at night um, uh, because he's convinced that we're going to have killer AIs. Um, uh, that seems a little bit far-fetched to me, but uh, are there areas where you're concerned that we're not fully grappling with and considering the ethical implications of the research that we're doing? Who's we? We, the scientific community, you. The scientific, uh, <laughs> the, 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 we is very the, hard the, to the, discuss. The, 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 the scientific community in a, in, you know, the, Scientists in a, on a larger so, so, scale. So let me say, uh, the, the, let's not worry about whether we are considering it or not. Let's worry about when we consider it, it's still hard. Right. So take climate change. I got friends who say, we've got to do geoengineering because we got a real problem. And if we don't geoengineer the planet to change the albedo and bounce, we're, we're, we're screwed. Yeah. We may have some th events that occur that we can't recover from. I got other people. Good friends of mine here also, I'm, I'm kind of ignorant, but I like engaging in this conversation, to say, are you out of your mind? Do you have any idea what might happen right. with a geoengineering gone wrong? So they view that as unethical to, to do. To consider it, even. No, no, nobody will go so far. If you put it in the form of, is it unethical to think about right, but, it? But no. that would be an unethical but, outcome. But it, it, it would be irresponsible right. to go do that with anything like what we've got. I think the point is, these are hard things. Almost always, there are hard trade-offs. When I talk about you know all of the bioengineering that can be applied to human health, and that there's no bright line that separates it from the bioengineering that can make bioweapons. When I look at the AI that can be used to, oh, I don't know, to predict suicide risk and help do suicide prevention. Right. It's also AI that can be misused to go decide um, who should be sentenced to longer t terms in jail, but it ends up uh, you know, engaging lots of discriminatory information. In. Right. The problem is these aren't simple lines to draw. All of these are hard things to struggle with. And now your question would be, are we struggling with it? Enough? Right, exactly. And, but that's enough. And of course we're not struggling with it enough. They're daunting problems. We need, to, we need to teach hard about it. We need to think hard. We need to make it exciting for students to be able to engage in it and think about solutions we haven't thought of. And they can't just be students of science engineering. They're going to be students who bring in the whole range of human disciplines. If we're not struggling with those questions enough, what can we do to incentivize both scientists who are now at the pinnacle of their careers and also scientists who are coming up through their careers, how, how can we change that culture? We could have MIT communications forums that discuss yes. it. Right. <laughs> this, this will, in fact, change the culture of science. Um, well, it, well, it'll help. Would we, right. would we have had a discussion like this even five years ago? Yeah, and we wouldn't. They, um, Is that true, that you think uh, that this discussion wouldn't have, this wasn't as much of a topic of conversation? It certainly was. It's just I, my well, I, no. I, I certainly wasn't asked to right. talk about right. it. Right. <laughs> no. it. It's come up much more. I mean, you know, we, we, did a panel together Ash with Carter. Ash Carter. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was moderating rather than on the panel, but Maria and Ash were the panelists on, on similar topics. I think it is something we're feeling it's just the responsibility of this age, and it's becoming clearer and clearer. That and the, I mean, the, the faculty, institute, they're asking for it. Right. They're, they're asking for these discussions to take place. <laughs> and, um, and so because um, what we, what I think what we, don't want to have happen is to have some pronouncement come down that, all right, no, you don't work on this kind of AI. Right. 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 And, um, and uh, you know, our, our faculty and our researchers, they want to be aware of what the issues are and, and have conversations with their colleagues and decide for themselves what's the right thing to do. And they, and, and then, <coughs> When asked about it, they they want to 
say I've thought about it and have a good answer. I mean, it's sort of everything we do around here. So I, I assume that any decision that I make here at MIT, that I'm going to get hauled before Congress and have to explain it, OK? And, um, and it's happened, uh, so don't think that this is, uh, you know, I'm just making this up. Um, but it, I mean, it doesn't mean that, that, uh, that we necessarily take the safest path just because I don't want to get skewered. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, um, but it means that you want to think it through and get asked the question and say, no, we've, we've thought about it, and, and here's where we're coming down on it. And, and so so uh, obviously, you don't want a pronouncement saying, do this research, don't do that research. What about a pronouncement saying, uh, um, to do research, there has to, be, you, there has to be in proposals an ethical component? <laughs> Um, a, a, a discussion of the ethics of how this research is going to play out well, about integrating that into. I'm, I'm, I'm only laughing because. No, no, please laugh away. It's not once you it's hard to it, embarrass me. No, no, once you make it the requirement that the grant proposal contain or, a section that, on that, I'm, granting agencies want to do that, but. But they become. Oh, there's, there's, you're going to have boilerplate. You're going to have boilerplate that gets pasted in. Paste in. So you will have checked that box. <laughs> right. That can't be enough. Sure, do it, but it, it can't be enough. And it almost you know, risks alienating people because if it becomes, you have to have promised that you have thought about the ethics and, and have an ethicist on the proposal. Sure, right, right. It's got to be much more vibrant than that. We've got to actually argue about this stuff. We've, but is there a way to make it organic and vibrant and also ensure that those discussions are happening as opposed to it sort of bubbling up through the culture? Well, I, I think there's a responsibility for, for us as leaders yep. to, um, to raise these issues with our colleagues. Um, but, I, but I see it coming both ways. Um, you know, th things, things work a lot better if if um, if they bubble up, right. But, um, right. but it's but it's but I think it's perfectly fine for us to say, hey, have you thought about this? And and it does start conversations. You know, I mean, right. on a on a variety of difficult issues here at MIT and also at the Broad. You know, we were talking about this before. You know, our president or or Eric, you know, puts out a very our president thoughtful, meaning Raphael, yeah, not Raphael, not, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> MIT. To clarify, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, puts out an extremely thoughtful note right. about a difficult subject, which um, you know that that actually generates a lot of conversation, not only among our community but among our alums, and, and actually well be, well beyond right. our community in terms of the feedback that we get. But um, so um, so, like I said, I think it has to come at all levels. In, in small ways, I I teach and have taught for. 27 years, MIT's intro bio course. Right. One of the sessions is devoted to molecular biology and society. We look at genome editing and other things, and we devote one of these freshman classes to it. And I think we could probably go further. You could ask, should problem sets? Right. Be, should each problem set include something that has social implications? Should it get woven in more? Right. Yeah, probably. We have to figure out how to do it well. We have to do it in a way that challenges people to think freshly about it and argue about it. And is that something that has been in the course in the 27 years you've taught it? Or it's been in the course for about 12 years now. Okay. And, it's, and I do it as a case method discussion. It's not a lecture. Right. I put up a few things, and then we engage in a full room discussion. And sometimes, you know, I've had 500 students in the class. But... You know, it's we, a big full room discussion. Well, it is, but but it, but people get really, really. It's the it's the most active discussion in the entire year, because you know people they just open up to the challenges, and and you get people who disagree, and it's great. And sometimes a large room is really good because you'll take people you'll get people who will take an unpopular minority position and then have to defend it, and and people who who realize that there was some challenge in something that they said. It's, I love it, and right. so it's part of it. And I think we'll probably increasingly see more of this embedded in the curriculum. Right, right. You know, it's tougher in, in say, calculus, but otherwise. Yes. Right. Hopefully all those people in math will move over to biology. Like, <laughs> um, uh, all right, there are 
I, I could go on for a long time, but let's open it up to all of you. Um, just a reminder, uh, please come to one of the microphones um, and introduce yourself when you ask your question. And don't be shy, come on in, yeah. You don't need to raise your hand. You can just, you can just come up. to the mic, yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, I'm Josh. I'm a fourth year undergrad here, uh, senior. What are you um, studying? I'm studying uh, robotics. Cool. So cool. Relevant to the stuff you're talking about. So I think I'm going to ask a, maybe a pretty basic question. So uh, bear with me a bit. But so we've just been discussing the whole time that we have, uh, as scientists and engineers, a responsibility for the consequences of our research and how it's used. Um, but what we also led off with was that some of the magic of basic research is that we don't necessarily know where it will lead or what the consequences of that will be. So isn't there a contradiction there? And given that um, both of you have been engaged in this really fundamental research throughout your whole careers, are you confident that that has and will leave the world better than you found it? And if you are, you know, where does that confidence come from? <laughs> oh. <laughs> MIT students are tough. Oh. <laughs> so there's no contradiction. I think the fact that we don't know where it's going to lead and that it can lead to such amazingly good things is the source of the responsibility because we know it might not lead to those things. So they go together. If we could predict what the consequences were, we could just shut down the research that was going to end up being on balance bad. But we can't because of this miracle machine we don't know where it's going to go, which means when you give birth to something, you're responsible to, for it, for shaping where it goes. You know, the people who thought about nuclear energy didn't think about, you know, about nuclear physics, didn't necessarily think about bombs, but when they had to build bombs in World War II, they felt they then had a lifelong responsibility to attend to making sure we didn't blow ourselves up with bombs. They, they are part and parcel of each other, that the unpredictability of the technology means you have a lifelong responsibility. So then you ask, are we confident it's going to be used for on balance good? I am, but only because at heart I'm an optimist that you can get people to see that. But it takes a lot of work. I don't think it's a theorem that it happens. I don't think it happens without a tremendous amount of work. I think it takes a lot of moral persuasion. I think it takes a lot of argument to happen. And I agree that on any given year, it could go wrong and it could go wrong badly. And that's a real risk. Um, and it just means we have to work really, really, really hard. I'm an optimist because I think, I think people, most people want the world to be a better place. But it is not easy because it doesn't take, a, doesn't take a large group of people who want to weaponize something to make it really, really hard. And in the 1950s and 1960s, the things we were dealing with um, with nuclear weapons, they were pretty easy to detect. As you move down to chemical weapons, biological weapons, AI weapons, they become almost impossible to detect. And so the norms that are going to keep us in check are going to have to be strong and strong international norms that countries don't do certain things. But we did sign treaties like that, and shockingly, they did stick. That's why I care a lot about the existence of norms, and it bothers me when we break norms, because norms keep us in check sometimes. Um, I think you know, that, that, that's kind of the weaponized uses, but you know, there, there are these other things that, that could just displace jobs. They're, I count optimistically and I think much more confidently on the fact that there is a young generation of people who come along who want to fix the world. And they will find ways to fix the world. I don't think there, it's a theorem that AI has to displace work. I think there, that's, that's a downhill kind of thing. That's flowing with the energy that people are going to come in and figure out how to use it for good. But we need to inspire people to feel like that's part of the job. And so as teachers, as universities, you know, whether this happens in the right way is going to be a direct function of, of how many people we inspire and how many people we, we bring up with that sense of responsibility. If you lose those things, if you lose norms, if you lose sense of responsibility, yeah, you can get a world you don't like. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just add to that. I mean, the, the very fact that we have to keep after 
these discoveries and make sure they get used well, make sure they get deployed well. I mean, it's part of the reason that Eric and I are not doing as much of our own research now as we have done in the past. I mean, we've both taken on you know, a considerable amount of government service, but also you know, uh, advisory, you know, many, many advisory councils for scientific societies and for the government to, um, to ponder these things and put out thoughtful reports and, and, uh, and, and go out and talk about them and do events like this a lot um, in order to raise these issues. So, um, so there, there is a big responsibility that those who create these things really have to be responsible for continuing to guide them in the, in the right direction. Good question. Yeah. Come on, folks. Yeah, yeah. come on up. Good. Yeah. Um, so I was curious about when you talked about like bringing up these ethical dilemmas and ethical issues um, and how a lot of times people defer on them and um, I'm taking a bioethics class right now and what I found interesting was um, there is a specific case talked brought up about the in, um, institutional review boards and I was curious um, what exactly does that role of like ethical dilemma really actually play in the greater sense because if people defer on so many values um, and especially as you said with like communication and technology bringing people both closer together but also revealing a lot of these differences how do we further like reconcile these differences and how can these kind of values be like brought together and how can there be like a consensus formed whatsoever if it's so diverse and different which is both something that we triumph over but also something that kind of creates that divide. Yeah, I'll, well, I'll start with that yeah, one please. and toss it over to you. So, um, yeah, so the, the Institutional Review, Review Board at, at MIT is, <laughs> is under my office. And one of the things that we've done this year is, uh, is add social scientists and humani uh, humanists to that board. So be, because these issues are arising and we felt that it was really important that we get those voices um, into the discussion. So, so it's a... It's a it's an ongoing um, situation, but but and we're we're already seeing it. But that's the kind of action we've taken to um, to start to move in that direction of of handling these these really difficult issues. When you got differences, you didn't go to two different <laughs> outcomes. You can yell at each other and go to your corners and harden your differences, or you have differences amongst people who say, okay, if you see this so differently, I gotta understand what you're thinking. And I gotta inform myself about, about how you could possibly believe that. And what I see around here at its best is people understand why you believe that and say, I think you're weighing that too much. Yes, that could be, but I don't think that's the likely outcome. But I now have to acknowledge that that's a possibility. And I've had to suddenly become more nuanced. So I worry about, does the world go to its corners or does the world move toward the middle? They're not going to blend. They're not going to give up on those differences. It bothers me no end that we are seeing social discourse go in this fashion of polarization. Polarization, there is no good outcome to polarization. Things are hard. We have to grapple with things. There are no easy solutions to anything in science, certainly no way to get the benefits of science. There are no easy solutions to economics. There are no easy solutions to politics. Diversity is not a nice nostrum. Diversity is essential to actually figuring out how to wend our way through a solution. And I think modeling discourse, as wimpy as it might sound to people who don't understand the power of it, is, some of, is one of the most important things that we have to have as a country, is the ability to have discourse between people who disagree in good faith. It's a great question. Maria, what, what was the, um, was there something that sparked the addition of social scientists and humanists into the IRB? Um, well, it was, it was just these discussions Scientific were questions. coming up and, uh, you know, we just looked at it and said, well, you know, we, we've got a, 
get some more discussion going in in these groups. Right. And, um, so that's, uh, that was what that was what drove it. So. And you've got community members on an IRB too, yeah. which is really such a brilliant innovation. Because yeah. there might have been a time you'd think you just want scientists on the IRB because they understand. Yeah. But they only understand a certain bit of it. And is that something that MIT does that is not done everywhere, having community members on IRBs? And uh, I think that's a general requirement for medicine, at least. Med for medicine. Medicine. It may not yeah. be in other things. Yeah. Medicine requires at least one community member. Yeah. And precisely. We don't, we, don't, and we don't have a medical school, so right. we're, yeah, we're right. off. But, um, right. but we, we certainly do interact with right. uh, you know, clinicians. So. All right. Katie, I'm a Brody, actually. Oh, hey. Hi. Hi. What are you doing at the Brode? Uh, I'm a project coordinator with the MacArthur Group. Awesome. Cool. Right. Um, so actually building on that question about the expansion of the IRB and including social scientists and humanists and tying it back to early on in the conversation when we were talking about how the miracle machine kind of came about by this unconventional path of rather than government laboratories introducing academia and industry and other groups to bring technological development as we move towards ethical questions in technology, do you think that's going to exclusively kind of be the tone of this discussion that it's the responsibility of each individual member involved? Or do you think that will add to new additions and growth of the miracle machine? And do you, what kind of groups do you think will be involved in that growth if it's going to happen that way? Well, hopefully a lot of people are gonna be involved in this conversation. I mean, I, 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 I frankly, uh, I frankly do expect the government to get involved, and, and, and in, in some of these areas, the government should get involved, and, and the question is, how does the government get involved in the right way, okay? And, um, and so, um, you know, the, the goal is gonna be and will be a part of that discussion here, uh, many, 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 many more people than, you know, the two of us here, but, uh, but just to make sure that, um, that we preserve what's great about the miracle machine. I mean, actually, our, our discussions, you know, with with a lot of folks in D.C., including a lot of folks who you wouldn't think would uh, would be viewing the conversation this way, is like they they realize what America, America's innovation ecosystem has brought to this country, and um, and and they don't want it ruined on their watch. And, um, and so, um, you know, there, there has to be a way to get a sufficient number of voices involved in this so that you can have a rational conversation to, to say, let's, let's keep what's great about this, let's evolve it, right, and, and let's not break it. Yeah. Also, people take initiatives to create groups. During the period when we had a Cold War, there was the Pugwash conferences and the Physicians Against Nuclear War. Um, I wouldn't be shocked to see, I'd be thrilled to see around this community, people begin to organize the societies that are gonna help debate these questions about AI um, and, and many others. I think there are many, many forms. There's the government, for sure. And then there's individual initiative. All, all these groups that take responsibility to do things started by some small group of often students who feel like that's what the generation has to do. While we're letting people screw up their courage. Um, uh, one, one issue um, that I know has come up is a, is a question of uh, especially cooperating with China and, and given that they have not always uh, adhered to these norms. So how does, how do you, how does one grapple with that tension that you want to both be able to collaborate and partner with as wide a group of people as possible and you have some places where there are these very legitimate concerns about how that information is gonna be used, about IP theft, about all sorts of issues. Yeah, well I, um Actually, I was just on the phone with the Pentagon um, before I came over here, um, talking about these issues. So we, you know, we, China has learned a lot from us. Um, uh, we actually have a lot to learn from China in certain areas, and um, 
and uh, you know these these issues of uh, IP theft are uh, they're real. Um, the um, you know the the easy thing to say is that anything on a university campus is just open research, and so we publish it, and so we shouldn't it. be concerned about. But um, but the the fact of the matter is um, you know and and if, and if it's sensitive, classify it, and then we're all done. Okay. Um, however, um, there are um, there are there's research being done in labs all over the world where any one part of it might be perfectly reasonable and open, but if you took several things together and combined it, um, it could be very detrimental. Yeah. And um, and so um, so it, it's it's really a case of you know we need to. Um, we need to have all countries um, uh, obeying international norms, okay, for uh, data use, data release, um, and responsible use of information. And um, and so, um, you know, part of this happens because um, uh, people in different countries they want to publish their papers in the best journals, right? And so, um, so to publish in the best journals, there has to be a certain amount of Transparency in terms of discussion of your methods, and you know, making your raw data available, making your the programs available that you, you know, uh, did this analysis for, and um, and so um, so so you know, reviewers have a role to play in this. The journals have a role to play in this. Um, actually, some of this is going to be done diplomatically. Uh, there's a role in that, but. Um, but basically, I, I think it's a matter that we've we've got to get everybody to play by a set of established rules, and and if we do that, then we can all learn from each other and continue to collaborate. And what if people don't play by a set of established rules? Well, then then uh, things are going to change in terms of access. Uh, I mean. If, if one country doesn't, then you have international norms about this, you ostracize them. Right. But that requires a rule-based international order. Do we have that right now? I mean, do we have the ability to? We did. And, you know, it's, and it's not just uniquely United States. I think we're seeing much more of a migration from a rule-based international order to you know, countries simply exerting power because they can. So interlocking systems that were put in place sound in the short run, you know, weak. In the long run, may be very strong. In the long run, our best defense with China may be entanglement with China at right. many levels. Best defense is, is sort of collaboration, essentially. Well, in, well, essentially, countries that actually benefit from each other tend not to go to war with each other. Right. And so making it in people's enlightened self-interests. Uh, but then you have to be thinking about long-term self-interest, not just short-term self-interest. Right. I think you have more faith in people's enlightened self-interest than I do. Do you have an alternative? Well, no. I certainly don't have an alternative. But well, fine. Then I'm going stick to stick with mine until you got an alternative. <laughs> I mean, yeah. We, 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 yeah, okay. Uh, that's a longer discussion. Yeah. We can have it another point. Who else you got? Jason. Yeah. Hi there. I'm uh, Jason Deere. I'm a Knight Science Journalism Fellow. Um, from I, where? Um, the Associated Press. Cool. cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm from San Francisco, and I lived there for 23 years and watched as the city really changed um, as city leaders gave away a lot of public resources to the tech companies. And, you know, now awesome. firemen and policemen and Teachers can't live there. It's become really an island of the wealthy. Um, and now I live here, and I'm seeing kind of similar indications around MIT of, you know, what's uh, similar types of things that are happening with the, uh, the new life sciences buildings that are being built around campus. And I'm wondering if MIT is looking to the West Coast and the mistakes that were made out there in planning and um, allowing kind of companies to come and influence the planning and development of the city um, to the detriment of a lot of people who live there, and if MIT or is working with Cambridge or any of the community here to kind of help 
ease the transition that I see going on around campus in this Absolutely. area. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a big part of the discussion, so. How? <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, MIT wouldn't be building any of those buildings in um, Kendall Square uh, if it if it wasn't if the plan wasn't approved by the Cambridge City Council, so um, so there there's been a lot of interaction with the City of Cambridge in terms of you know what has to happen in terms of affordable housing and providing internet for neighborhoods, etc. 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 And um, and there's a, another area where the uh, called Volpe, which is um, kind of across the other side of the Marriott. Which, um, which MIT also um, received the, the bid to develop. And, um, and you know, there's, again, there's plans going on for how this is gonna affect the local community and what are we gonna do in terms of housing, you know, for people there. But, but these, you know, these discussions are, uh, are ongoing. And, you know, Cambridge, the, the, uh, the Cambridge City Council is, um, is, is extremely involved. You know, there's a, a lot of people who spend a lot of, Time on that, so these, you know, there's a there's a lot going on in terms of negotiations, and you know, we have to live here with this community, and um, and actually, MIT was was awarded the Volpe site because of our experience of working with the Cambridge community. So if they had given it to another developer, there would be a far less of an understanding of the sensitivities. You know, I mean, MIT kind of has you know a sense of what these neighborhoods need to be. You know, we want our um, we want our students and faculty to, you know, be able to live in this neighborhood and live nearby. And uh, so, and the reason you're building here it, is because well, of and MIT interestingly, I mean, yeah. you know, a number of years, probably ten years ago now, there was a plan for, you know, building a building for faculty housing, you know, nearby campus, and it just had no traction. No one wanted to live in near campus. And, and now everybody wants to live in near campus, and this is getting to be some of the you know, hottest real estate, real estate um, going. So, you know, so, so there. That, yeah, and that's the point is just who can, who can live here. You that's know, right. You know, is, is, is there, and, and MIT it certainly plays a role in that because you're, the reason the companies are coming and building here is because of the access to talent. And but I mean, as a citizen of Cambridge, I think it's good that MIT is thinking hard about it and is responsible, but it's really our responsibility as the city government, you know, uh, to citizens to have a city government that thinks about how do we use the tax revenues that come out of the city from all of these companies that are here to guarantee affordable housing. And when I look at it, I don't yet see, but this is not MIT's issue, this is our city council's issue, the formula that will say corporate real estate taxes will funnel into some kind of affordable housing so that we can achieve the mix we want. You know, I'm no expert on this, but I see we're gonna set aside something that will be affordable housing for some period of time. What I don't see is a sustainable formula that will keep a balance, but what I do believe is like the folks around MIT are smart enough and think enough about systems and economics and other things that our city council could benefit from people saying, how do we build this as an organic, sustainable, ongoing thing that keeps our community mixed? And if they needed those questions answered, they could probably come here and- Sorry? If they needed those questions answered, well, they well, could but, probably come here and find- Yes, but they probably need answer. the questions answered, but like with much in the Miracle Machine, it probably starts with students and, and faculty who say, oh, I see a better way to do this. I see a need for municipalities to be able to strike balances and to be creative about it. And the effect won't just be on Cambridge. I mean, many ideas come out of this community, ideas about Affordable Care Acts and many other things. I think the idea about how you engineer government systems so that they work better for everybody is part of the product of a place like MIT and a Harvard. And, and when we say it's a product of MIT and a Harvard, it's a product of people who just decide they're gonna pull together and do it. So if you're bothered by this and you're in this community, go organize a study group and get some economists and figure out on, why don't we have 
<laughs> Why don't we have well, an it organic right formula that makes yeah. it work? Because I actually ask this question a lot. I'm, I'm sensitive to it too. So you yeah. know, what are you doing about it? Yeah, and I, well, I've yeah. written a lot about <laughs> it. A way to turn that around? Yeah. <laughs> I've written a lot about it, and I guess that's why I asked is because um, you know, seeing it from the other coast, and we were talking about the divide earlier, you know, or you noticed yeah. that, not the divide, but the differences, I guess, is yeah. how you wanted to spin it. But, um, <laughs> it, yeah. but, but no, I just thought it was interesting um, coming here from the West Coast, having seen the real devastation that a lot of the kind of uh, policies that, it, that, that the city has made, the decisions that they've made in conjunction with the technology industry, you know, many are fueled by graduates of this university and many of the other great universities in our country. And um, just, ha you guys are having this discussion tonight, which is great. And I, since I've been here, I think MIT has been, it's been something I've been hearing from the professors and students and talks about, talk about the effects of the work and the innovations here and what they have. But um, I think uh, there's still a lot more to be learned in terms of the effects on, uh, on the cities where a lot of these innovations are happening and of the changes that are occurring. So as a journalist, you have special superpowers also to contribute to this. So I'm, I'm not I joking around in saying things happen because people care about them. You obviously care about the problem. You're knowledgeable about the problem. You know, I think you'll find people who are eager to help, but it takes leadership. Indeed. Thanks. Well, Maria, am I, am I right in remembering that the development does include set aside for, yeah. for affordable housing yeah. specifically? Yeah, yeah, I think the MIT projects are doing a very good job yeah. of it. I'm much more concerned of do we on have a larger, formula yeah. on a larger scale. I think MIT is not the locus of the. Right, right. I, I just, that, that was my memory. I just didn't yeah. know if that was. I think, I think those projects are well thought out. Right, right. Hi, my name's Ronit. Um, I'm a third year undergrad um, in the computer science department. Um, and I had just a general question about like balance. So you spoke, so we have kind of these things that we see where there's like billions of dollars being invested into like the biotechnology industry. But if you look at things like the Biological Weapons Convention, which is like supposed to keep us safe from these bioweapons, it's like critically underfunded. Um, and it's also always at, at a budget deficit. But then also the fact that we're seeing a lack of investment into research, or just how do we balance like this investment in, in creating new technologies and really supporting those industries while also making sure that we don't lose, like that we actually invest in preparedness. Um, and in the same kind of balancing way, like how do we make sure that we are supporting these like norms, but also regulating them in, a, in an efficient way, like from an actual like government, like top down way without telling you to stop doing your research. Yeah, so I mean, these, these discussions are just going on constantly and um, uh, and um, I mean, on the, the bio side, you know, the, I, so I, you know, part, part of the challenge that we, uh, we run into on the kind of the bioterror side is that there isn't a whole lot of expertise on that in the Pentagon. So they, they know how to make the next big plane or, you know, the next big ship, and they know a whole lot less about what they ought to be investing in in terms of what you know the the bioterror hazards are, and in fact, I, I don't know if you remember it, Ash Carter when he was Secretary of Defense brought up a whole group from the Pentagon and yeah. spent time here yep. and you at were, the Broad, you were in, yeah, at, and at the Broad, you know, educating themselves on on what these risks were, so that the the Pentagon could plan better for them and. Um, and that's, you know, so, so that, that is an ongoing thing. And, and actually out at Lincoln Lab, which, which I oversee, which is, um, uh, you know, they're, they're investing more in biology as well. I mean, there's, there's really, it turns out there's really, really interesting work in this sphere. And, it, and it's based on infectious diseases. And, and, it's a, and it's fundamental research that's actually excellent and, uh, and, and actually, People in the life science areas don't think about this as a, you know, co possible career path. But it's, you know, there's there's a, a great you know social motivation to, you know, kind of get involved in that kind of work. And and it's actually very very interesting and state of the art research as well. So I so I think we're going to be seeing more in that area actually. I I agree. One of the last reports that PCAST worked on was essentially on these questions of bioweapons. And 
there were some in the Department of Defense who inclined in the short term to say, well, shouldn't we just classify all this stuff? And we had to kind of explain that this wasn't going to happen because most of it, 95% of it plus, was going on in the open scientific community. And even if the US tried to classify it, the rest of the world was doing it, it wasn't going to happen. So we took the position that we were going to need to use the technology that could be used offensively to be able to rapidly build defense as needed. We had to get incredibly good at defeating a bioweapon and, and rapidly vaccinating against bioweapon, et cetera, et cetera. We said, and we weren't going to get to practice on a bioattack. We're going to have to practice on natural disease. And that there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a nice alignment that if we wanted to provide biosecurity as a matter of national defense, we really had to be investing hard in dealing with natural outbreaks. And uh, I think that's probably the right answer there, is that the technology is we're going to have to get really good, and we're just going to have to do it by saving lives against natural diseases, and we can chop it up against our natural defense budget, uh, national defense budget. You know, more broadly, you're asking about public goods. Um, private goods, it's easy to get investments in companies, biotech, billions of dollars. You want investments in these conventions and these things that protect us. Those are public goods. They're not going to get the investment to private investors. And therefore, we need a country that believes in the importance of public goods. It again bothers me when I, when I hear people say, oh, you know, we don't want government to do things. There's some things you can't do but by government. Government is just the expression of people saying, what, do, what is our common needs and our common good that can't be solved by an investor? So I'm glad you're raising it. And the answer is continuing, continuingly to, to argue for the importance of investment in public goods. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you want to ask one on the way out? You could. It's OK. Uh, hi, I'm Harini. I'm a PhD student in computer science. Um, and my question is about changing research cultures. So fundamentally, like these ethics questions are interdisciplinary. And they, like you said, they require social scientists and humanists and methodologies and thinking from the humanities. But it's not clear to me that current scientific disciplines really appreciate and value interdisciplinary research. And I, and I mean, I think, I guess it makes sense because there are these norms and ways to benchmark success and accomplishment that are kind of baked into these established fields. Like in machine learning, for example, which is what I work in, there are these conf top conferences and you're kind of expected to publish in many of them. And, and there are things that they look for at, that, that they accept that are not really, not exactly uh, encouraging or appreciative of interdisciplinary methods. And so I guess as leaders in your fields, how do you think about changing the, like what's the best way to kind of start changing research cultures to be aware and appreciative of different things besides what has commonly led to success in those fields? Yeah, well, you know, we're spending so much time talking about that. You know, we just announced the College of Computing where we have to do what you just said in order for this to succeed. So, um, and, and this, it will succeed. We will, we will not fail um, at this. But, um, but, uh, but we're going to, you know, when we get assessments of individuals, you know, in certain fields, people look at certain things. And um, you, you, have to be, you have to be really smart about how you do your assessments. So I mean, the most important thing that we do um, as faculty at, at MIT is we, uh, in, in faculty development, we, we attract and, and then we promote and we retain and we train. And, um, and, um, and if we just go by traditional stovepipes, we're not going to be able to evolve the kind of interdisciplinary work that you're talking about that's so essential. So, um, so you've, you know, you, you've got to get people who are experienced in the different fields, and, the, and they've all got to kind of get together and you know, 
serve on, essentially serve on the committees that do these evaluations so that um, you know you could you could get somebody writing a negative letter you know about your work because it's missing this piece but of course they don't understand this whole piece but you know then you have evaluations over here of people who understand that and you know it, the, you know a, a really enlightened group will look at that and say well it's it's got all the pieces that we need so this is this is a matter of uh, ongoing interest, and, and it's going to be it's going to be tested in real time starting next September. So, in the short term, it's very frustrating that people have their boundaries and and expectations. If you integrate over a somewhat longer period, so much of the exciting stuff occurs at boundaries. Those early people who were doing stuff at Boundaries later in their careers when they're highly successful having pioneered this new thing that was at the Boundary get to tell the stories about how their papers were turned down and their grants were turned down. And, and they do that with this, you know, both smug satisfaction and still a little bit of an edge. Um, but that is how progress happens is most of the interesting stuff is at new interfaces that haven't been explored. And you shouldn't be too discouraged by that. There is some value in people defining these disciplines. And if you're interested in working at the boundaries of disciplines, you should, you should know that the story usually works out OK. You just have to be more stubborn. Thanks. Good luck. <laughs> we probably have time for one or two more questions. <clears throat> Anyone? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> That jack in the box. That's, That's great. <laughs> I had too much coffee today. Um, so my, na my name is Catherine Clark. I'm an associate professor of French studies here, um, and my training is in history. Um, and I wonder, so there have been all this, this talk about co computation at MIT and the new college, and in talking about reworking the GIRs, why aren't we talking about having a GIR in ethics or an ethics requirement for our students just to make sure that an expertise in science and technology in their fields is going hand in hand with an expertise, or not an expertise, but even just a, an awareness of how to have these debates and how to frame them and discussions with humanists happening in their undergraduate training. So, so there certainly has been discussion about ethics uh, for a GIR. I mean, there's also been discussions about uh, project-based learning for a GIR. Mm -hmm computation for a GIR, statistics for a GIR, um, <laughs> diversity for a GI, uh, climate change for G so, um, and then if that was the case, you'd have. <laughs> Maybe that know. should be six years instead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For any so, non-MIT so, people here, GIRs are general, general institute, institute requirements. requirements. Sorry, required, required course, basically, yeah. yes. So, um, so pro probably the, the best way to move forward on this um, is is not to make it a requirement, but to um, but to put courses out there that are easily findable and easily available, and uh, people will get attracted to those courses, and they are being attracted to those courses. But there's another interesting possibility, which is um, build it in. Build it in. Yeah. That yeah. that there's this notion. I guess there's a, a professor at Harvard. I'm forgetting her name right now. Um, who has been pushing embedded ethics. It might be that creating a GIR in ethics would also be less effective because yeah. it would be walled off and everybody would feel like they have to take the castor oil. Whereas if you said, you know, every course should have embedded ethics relevant to its field, then people might say, oh, ethics is not a separate thing. Ethics is part of the thing. That might be a really interesting movement. Yeah, certainly, certainly in the in the College of uh, Computation, um, the donor Stephen Schwartzman made it very clear from the beginning that he was he was interested in having ethics be a part of uh, of the curriculum. So, um, yeah, so I I think we're going to see this. Oh. Thank you all for being here. My name is Michael Simons. I used to work in the Department of Undergrad here at the Teaching and Learning Lab. Um, I wonder, 
you know, for all three panelists, we'll get Seth included. Uh, and uh, you gotta answer some questions. Yeah. Yeah. This is the easy I'm doing all the work. Yeah, yeah let's eat here. <laughs> I just get to sit back. <laughs> but in terms of your own um, things outside of your specialty, uh, biology and math, and um, very the entire you know, universe. Yeah. yeah, the universe and grinding lenses and. <laughs> Uh, did you, you know, inspiration from other areas such as literature, poetry, nature, and how, number one, was any of that part of your upbringing and did that inspire you in your field and do you seek people that have that? Did that provide value to you? And maybe the answer is no, I just do math or I just do, you know, particle physics. Yes, yeah, so, so I'll tell you what, what I did. So I, I was um, I, I was pretty, as I said, pretty focused on being a space scientist, and that's what I did. Um, but uh, um, I actually uh, did a fellowship at Radcliffe uh, for a year, and um, and I was I was in the class. Um, uh, Drew Faust, when she was dean of Radcliffe, decided to start bringing scientists into Radcliffe, and and I was like one of the first people that she recruited, certainly in the first class. And, um, and that year I spent, I read every book on the New York Times bestseller list mm. that year. Wow. Because you had to, or else you couldn't, if you went to lunch, you had nothing to say, right? right? You, uh, you had to, you had to. Right, culture you know, required. Yeah, to, and it was, um, and um, Drew actually tells a story that, you know, I mean, for me, I got the liberal arts education that I didn't afford myself <laughs> earlier in my, uh, I mean, really I read books cool. growing up, don't get me wrong, um, but I, I really gave myself the liberal education that I, you know, denied myself more broadly so that I could become a scientist, but it, it actually, I'm, it made me a much better scientist because, you know, I, there were poets there and social scientists and, and and to be able to have to to be able to explain my work to people like that, and to see how they explain their work, I mean, just really opened my eyes as to the way that you really need to think to communicate with other people who are, who are not scientists or engineers. And so it it uh, you know it, it you know helped me immensely to to get where I am today. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I wasn't as focused as you were for me. Yeah, I, was I was hopeless. <laughs> you, you were really, really focused. It's just amazing. So you know, I think of, of you know, just what influential things there were. There was a 1964-65 World's Fair in New York. And my mom took me to that 13 times. And cheap entertainment. Well, I, grew, I was in Brooklyn. It was Queens. It wasn't like infinitely far, but boy it opened my eyes to the fact that there was a world out there, which in my corner of Brooklyn you might not have known. And it was really quite amazing. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I was a student at Princeton, I took John McPhee's course. I don't know how many of you know John McPhee, oh, but an yeah. amazing <laughs> nonfiction writer. He taught a course called Literature of Fact on, on nonfiction writing. And it's influenced all my scientific writing. When I write papers, I still have John McPhee's editorial voice in my head. Um, I wrote for three years for the Daily Newspaper. And Daily Journalism was an amazingly powerful thing. Um, because I think as a, as a professor, you are in the business of communicating. You communicate in your class. You communicate in scientific papers and in scientific, scientific meetings. And, I think about those experiences and how they've shaped me. And I would credit them with a non-trivial portion of credit for whatever success I've had, is learning those things that I never learned in a science classroom. And I'm just, you're just making me think about what things influence me. There was an amazing Renaissance architecture course I took that for the first time I understood how it is that art develops. Art is not just stuff. Art is a conversation over time. And to watch arch Renaissance architecture develop over the course of, of, of several hundred years 
was you know, just like eye-opening for me to understand that there are those structures. And all of those things end up having an effect on the way I do science. And so I think all of us are, are very influenced in getting people exposed to things. You never know what it'll be. But I can still, you know, in my mind, walking around the World's Fair from 64, 65, and, and it, was, it was like pretty influential. So you want to think about how you expose people to things. I, I sort of feel like my entire career is being exposed to different things and then having the freedom to get obsessed about it and then move on to something else. Um, uh, but in high school, I read um, a, a essays by a biologist named Lewis Thomas. Oh, yeah. Uh, and was that in Lives in of a JAMA? Cell? Yeah, Lives of a Cell. But it, it, it was it was columns that he wrote either for JAMA or for the New England Journal. I can't. I'm not. I don't remember which. Um, but uh, uh, that had a big influence on me. I knew I didn't want to be a bench scientist, but that I wanted to be involved and in, and in, win in science. Um, but you know, I, I I was and still am. I have no musical affinity. I. I'm obsessed with music, so I spent the first four years of my career as a, as a music critic, um, uh, primarily so I could go to concerts for free. Um, <laughs> uh, also, how I wrote a book about the Red Sox, because I wanted to go to playoff games for free. Um, it's a good gig. Uh, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Way to go. Um, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so for me, I feel like my, my, the great, the most exciting thing I, I think journalism is the best career anyone could ever have. And the, the most exciting thing about it is that it gives one the freedom to find something that's exciting. And instead of needing to go through the Stations of the Cross, you just get to go to the best people in that area and say, spend a lot of time with me and teach you everything you know. And, and that's incredible. So um, I think uh, that about does it. If there's, unless anyone has one last question. Please, well, will everyone please join me in, in really thanking the speakers. <laughs>